All right, so let's, um, let's do some qualitative uh, work on the different types of potential surfaces like we have up there. So let's just recall what we were working on before was this one, A plus B goes to AB. And I just want to know qualitatively, what do we expect this to look like? So it, suppose we were in the high pressure limit so that the, um, the Boltzmann approximation was correct. So thermalization is fast. What, what, what would you expect? So it should be a straight line. So it should be approximately Arrhenius, right? And then we set a very low temperature. Sometimes these things tail up because of tunneling, right? So that was, that's normally what we expect. And actually, these also have, often have curvature at the end here sometimes, but that doesn't really matter. And that's because the Qs have a weak T dependence in them. OK, so that's what we'd expect. So this is for uh, high pressure. Now, what do we expect if the pressure gets a little bit lower? Where is the fall off going to occur first? Does anybody have an idea? So we, we'd expect fall off in the rate. The rate should get slower as we lower the pressure. And that's because as at high pressure, every time we come in, we get knocked down. But as we get to lower pressures, this won't be as fast. So some of these guys might bounce back out. So that means the net rate of loss of A and B will be less. Is that OK? So uh, where do you think that phenomenon would happen the more, at high temperature or low temperature? Any idea? High temperature. So why, do, why, why does it happen first at high temperature? Anybody have a? That's right. So at high temperature, these guys have higher temperature. More of them will have a probability of coming in at higher energies. So the, the, the proportion of the ABs that are initially formed that are higher energy will be more the higher the temperature is. Does that make sense? So if these are hotter, more of them will have high temperature. So they'll form more of the high, really highly excited ABs. And these guys, they fall apart super fast, right? Because the K of E is, has a very strong E dependence. So even a small change in the energy from here to here makes the reverse rate very much faster. And that's because the, uh, the decomposition rate of E is, is N of E over H rho of E. And the N of E goes up very fast with energy, because the energy of E is, is 0 here. And it gets faster. It goes zooms up as you go up in energy. So um, so these guys will fall apart faster, so they're a more important fraction of the total. So those guys aren't going to be quenched very effectively at a, at a certain pressure. They'll, they won't be quenched as effectively as at lower temperature. These guys live longer, so they're more likely to get knocked down. These guys zoom out quickly, so only a small fraction will get knocked down. Does that make sense? OK, so as a consequence, at high temperature is where you're going to see the fall off first. So then maybe you'll see something like this. OK, so the temperature is low enough. This is not important. You're still, you're still going to capture all the, everybody that gets across the barrier gets knocked down. But as you get to higher, the higher energy guys don't get knocked down. So at high temperature, you see a fall off. All right? And then, so this would be at, this is like super high T, high pressure. This is high pressure, not as high as this one. And then we'll have other ones that'll be like this where it's, uh, this is you know, more medium pressure. All right? And then what happens at really low pressure? So, so I run this reaction in a vacuum. What will happen? No matter how long it takes to disassociate it, it will disappear. Yeah, so the rate will just basically go to zero. Right? It'll go way down. Because the, you, the net rate, the A and B, they still hit each other, but the, all the guys that are formed just come back, so you don't, the rate like goes away. And it, the rate is proportional to the pressure at the, in the low pressure limit. So uh, this is like, you know, this is a lower pressure. Here's, here's a low pressure. Something like that. You know, it goes down, down, down. Is that OK? 
uncertainty if we know better on this structure or pi Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So which, which of these can we calculate better? Anybody have a guess of which thing we can calculate better? Um, so I think, I believe, no, do I believe this? I think we can compute the, um, the high pressure limit rates better. Um, all we can use is we just use the regular transition state theory. We don't have to worry about any collision parameters. So it doesn't matter what value of alpha is, which we don't know. We don't have to do any master equations. We don't have to do anything. So I think we can do better for the high pressure limits. Um, in the extreme low pressure limit, the formula actually simplifies also. Uh, but there, it's 100% about the collision rate and the, and it, uh, maybe just the collision rate. So actually, maybe the extreme low pressure limit, we can do pretty well, too. And the in-between region is terrible, <laughs> because you're sensitive to everything. You're sensitive to your barrier height, your sense of your A factor, and you're also sensitive to all the collision parameters and the energy transfer parameters. So everything we don't know is what you're sensitive to. Um, yep. Any, any change on tunneling in lower spectra? Um, you can have the tunneling, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The tunneling doesn't change, but the effect of it does. So if I have, in reality, it takes several collisions to get down. And so normally, once you have the first collision, you've reduced the reverse rate so much that you'll probably have additional collisions. OK? Um, but if you had some odd case, like an interstellar space, uh, then the fact you lost one might be enough that you might still have a long enough lifetime here that maybe you could tunnel through and go back. So it could, it, it, you could uh, conceivably see this. And I think. There are some experiments done at super low temperatures, and they see stuff like this where the tunneling becomes complete. The whole story is all the about the tunneling. Um, but in the, real, in the combustion applications, this is usually not a deal. And the reason why the, the modified strong collision method works so well is actually about this, that you know, when I knock down from this level to here, just that one, one little bit of energy, I go from a really fast rate to a much slower rate. That's basically enough to catch almost everything. So once it had the first collision, the first collision that significantly takes any energy out, that's basically enough to get it to be quenched. So that's why the, this, the strong collision type models are not so bad, even though the, it's obvious that this, this one collision didn't take it all the way down to here. There's no way it could absorb that much energy. But it's still enough to knock the rate down enough that it makes it live long enough to have to suffer more collisions and go down, down, down. OK. Uh, and this, so this is what the rate looks like as a function of temperature. Um, the other way you saw it in the plots was log k versus log p. And that one usually looks like this, um, where this is the low pressure limit where it's a straight line. This is the high pressure limit where it's flat. And this is the intermediate region where it could have all kinds of goofball shapes. Um, all right? And uh, in the this is the Lindemann, and everybody will give you these two. This is the transition state theory rate. This is uh, sort of like the Lindemann rate, the low pressure limit. This one here, for a simple case like this, the TROA form would work very well. And, C and Ed Law has his own form, too, that would work, also work very well here to parameterize that. For a more complicated case with multiple wells, then this, that would, this wouldn't work. OK, so we're good with that, that case? So now let's try something a little bit different. Now we have a potential like this, no barrier. OK, so here's A plus B. Here's AB. Oh, actually, I, I didn't. So we did this in the direction A plus B goes in. How are things different if I did it in reverse? Any ideas? Shouldn't be that different. So the, the, the P dependence, yeah, so, so the reverse rate, the, this rate, K A B to, to A plus B is equal to K A plus B to A B, which we just wrote, um, 
like divided or multiplied by an equilibrium constant, right? Because the, the ratio of those two guys is equal to an equilibrium constant. And so whatever shape that has, we just have to divide it by an equilibrium constant. Now this thing does not depend on, on pressure, only on temperature. So uh, it'll, it, it'll change this shape. In particular, this direction is, has a much higher EA. So the whole steepness of this slope will be much stronger because um, it'll be much faster at high temperatures and much slower at low temperatures. Um, but the p-dependence will be, still be the same. And when you get the case where the rate's zero, it's still going to be zero in the reverse, too. Is that OK? OK, so let's try this one. So this is a plus b goes to a b, no barrier. So first of all, how the heck do we do it? Variational transition theory, correct. So we would uh, do variational. I would make a comment that there's two ways this is done. I think the correct way to do this is microcanonical. So get KIVs and then Boltzmann average them later. But a lot of people, this is I think is the right, it's correct. But a little bit simpler is to do canonical. And so you'll see a lot of papers where they do canonical. And all they do is basically try having a saddle point here, try setting the dividing surface here, try setting the dividing surface here, try setting it here, and just try different values and find if you try several and one of them is the minimum in between, you say, well, that's the right one, OK, to get the rate. Right. And you can just use the um, regular ROHO um, formulas. But notice that the EA is negative. You're going like sort of downhill every time. So it's kind of strange. Um, but that's what you see experimentally, actually, is that the rates actually get faster at low temperature, which is kind of weird, but true. Um, all right, so we do, the micro, we, we do this. This should still have the same problem. So you really want to do microcanonical because you're going to have to do a pressure a fall off calculation as well. Now, in the high pressure limit, um, what do we expect this plot to look like? So we have log of k versus 1 over t, the Arrhenius plot. In the high pressure limit for a plus b goes to a b, what do we expect? Um, it still matters because the energy is still conserved. So when they come in, they'll form the guy here. And this is still well above this. And actually, there's no barrier. So this goes to go flying right back out. So yeah, so it doesn't matter. But right now, let's assume we have really high pressure. So we're in the, so Boltzmann is correct. What, what shape do we expect the, the t, what's the t-dependence of the rate constant be like? It's just right. So it'd be pretty flat, maybe slightly negative. Something like that is what people see. And to get the exact shape of this and the exact number, you'd have to do a variational calculation. Um, how about the reverse rate? What, what's the t-dependence of that going to look like? Right, so is this with the equilibrium constant? Because the equilibrium constant really favors this over this. It's going to make this very slow to go back, right? So it's way uphill. So it's going to have a very, very strong t-dependence. So this is a plus b to ab, and this is the reverse. And just keep in mind that the, the time, the, even the units are different. So I write log of the k, but I actually have to have something with units over here. So th this has units of per second, but this will have units of centimeters cubed per mole, per mole per second or something like that. Okay. Yeah, usually people do that. Yeah, people you almost always do it because this error bar on this number is, is pretty small. Even if you just guess, all these guys are, are sort of similar. They're sort of close to the diffusion rate, diffusion limited reaction rate. And so you can guess it pretty well. It has a weak t dependence. You might not be able to guess that correctly. 
you have to do a variational calculation. But if you, just, if, you don't, if you don't want to do any calculation, you just want to guess, this is pretty good. Whereas your chance to guess this is really poor. You just look at it from that point of view, because it's like, how would you guess what that is? So the way, you, the way you think about it is you think of this first, then use the equilibrium constant to get the rest. And oftentimes, the, this guy, the biggest error here will be how good your thermo is for the equilibrium constant. Um, all right. Now, how about when we, when we lower the pressure? So this is the high pressure limit. If we lower the pressure, what will happen to these guys? That's right. So the same as, as that picture over there, pretty much, that this will be uh, much slower as, as you increase the, so this is P equals infinity. And this is just pretty high P. And the, it's pretty much slower at high temperatures, but at, at, room temp at low temperatures, it'll be about the same. And then this guy falls just as much, because it has to maintain the same equilibrium constant. So this will now be like that. So a plus, now A plus B basically won't happen anymore, uh, which is kind of weird, <laughs> right? Um, but that's the way it works. And then if you went to even lower pressures, you know, it now would be even like that, and this, this rate would now be like, like that. So this would be low, this would be low P. Okay, so far so good? Okay, guys, want to try some complicated ones now? Oh, um, that, that the equilibrium constant stays the same with the pressure, but you're, you're right that the total yield. So, yeah, this is a, actually a very important, tricky thing. When you have a common, common mistake is um, I have A plus B and it's going to and coming back from AB. And usually there's a, a bath gas, like nitrogen. So this is actually, in the models, you would write this way. Or, and sometimes I write plus M instead. Or plus M. OK, so you're looking at ChemKin data decks. It'll be like that. And this is warning you that it has fall off. And you might have a TROA form, you might have a log P form or something. And um, if you change the pressure, there's two ways you could do it. One way is you could keep all the mole fractions constant and change the pressure, in which case, suppose I double the pressure. Then I would double the concentration of A and B and nitrogen. And so the overall rate would increase by a factor of four because I doubled A, doubled B, and then it might increase even more because I've made, uh, I'm less in the falloff regime. So the rate might be tremendously faster if I take my same mole fractions and just squish it, okay? Um, uh, but if I instead keep A and B constant and just increase the amount of nitrogen, then I'll get a much smaller effect. So now I'm changing just the rate coefficient, changing the falloff effect, but I'm not changing the overall concentrations. And the same for the equilibrium. If I just add the nitrogen, it increases the forward and reverse rate equally. And so the, the equilibrium is not affected by adding nitrogen. Um, but if I compress the whole thing, I think that I'll shift it, the reaction will run more to the front. Because I've increased the forward rate by a factor of four, but I only increased the reverse rate by a factor of two. Is that OK? Yeah, so this, this causes unbelievable number of mistakes, innumerable. And of course, if you do it in a piston, when you increase the pressure, you often also simultaneously increase the temperature. And that will change the equilibrium constant. And that will also change the rate constants, just to make it really confusing. All right. OK, next, let's try. Uh, 
this one. So this is a plus b. Here's a, b. And here's c plus d. OK? So now I want to calculate the rate a plus b goes to a, b, just like before. All right, so I can do a regular transition state theory uh, um, calculation at the saddle point. In the high pressure limit, um, no problem. I just calculate this rate, k of t, I'm fine. Uh, except, um, well, in the high pressure limit, what do I, what's high pressure limit means? It means that there's so many colliders here that this goes wham and gets trapped immediately. Right? Now, if I lower the pressure a little bit, What's going to happen? So instead of being so good at, at quenching it, I'm just going to quench it a little bit slower. Now I might have a little bit of the stuff comes back, reacts backwards, right? Just like before. But I also can have stuff that reacts forwards and goes to C plus D. Do you see that? Yeah. And so um, now it's a little confusing to figure out what's going to happen. So let's do the high pressure limit one first, since that was easier. Logarithm of k, 1 over t, just the same as before, right? So this is a plus b goes to ab. OK? So now if I lower the pressure a little bit, what I did before was I said, well, I'm at high temperatures, I'm going to get some fall off, right? But now it's not really true. If I'm measuring just the loss of A plus, well, A plus B to AB, maybe it is true. So maybe it's the same as before. Um, in fact, maybe it's even more than before because I have all this extra loss going to C plus D. I'm not sure how to say that. But then I also have, in addition, I have A plus B going to C plus D. And so where, where will that be? So this, this stuff that, what, this, this difference represents stuff that came in through here and then didn't make it down to AB. So where did most of that stuff go? Mostly went to C plus D, right? So most of this difference must be A plus B goes to C plus D. So a plus B over C plus D must be very fast at high temperatures. So maybe it's, I don't know, it's big and then it shrinks to zero, something like that. So this is like A plus B goes to C plus D. Is that all right? And this is only, this is a, this isn't, I should do this dotted line too. So these are both for some medium pressure or some high P. High pressure, but not super high. This is the infinity. All right? Is this, is this OK? And then if I lower the pressure even more, this whole thing should happen even more, right? So it should happen all the way down at much lower temperatures. And again, now this whole thing, the C plus D channel has gone way up. And it's basically going to be the same as this rate. Um, actually, this one I should draw here, too. This one comes up. And by up here, it's almost the same as this rate because this is so much smaller, because this is a log plot. Right. So that's pretty weird. Yeah? Um, and all right, so that's, I guess that's all I'll say about this one. Um, how about what is AB doing? If I start from AB, what happens? So in the high pressure limit, when I start from AB, what happens? So, so, so I lower the pressure, the same thing happens, except everything gets slower because I have to have collisions to drive me up. So I get uh, the, rate, the same thing's happening. And this last step gets even more unlikely, because the, if I have some collisions going up here, 
on the way up, they kind of go out to make C plus D. And the, the slower the collisions are, the more likely they'll just go out. So the yield of A plus B will drop off faster than the yield of C plus D will drop off at lower as I lower the pressure. So in the really high pressure limit, if I do the transition state theory calculation, I may calculate that this is like a, you know, 100 to 1 as the product ratio. But then if I lower the pressure, maybe it would be 1,000 to 1 or 10,000 to 1. All right? OK. How about if I come in from C plus D? What, what happens? So suppose I am at low temperature and high pressure. What's, what's the main product? You're not going to have enough available free energy to excite AB. No, I'm sorry. How do I start from C plus D? So come in this way. If I'm really low temperature, it'll be really slow, right? It'll come into the wall and it'll just bounce back. If I increase temperature a little bit, I'll get mostly AB. So mostly go across and then immediately get cooled down by the collisions. OK? Um, if I increase the temperature more, now I have enough, I have some population way up here. Some of these guys will come in and get quenched at really high pressure to C plus, to AB, but some of them might have, um, the lifetime of this thing is very short. Most of these guys might come back, and a little tiny bit of them might dribble through to make A plus B. Is that right? Okay. All right, so that's that one. Uh, um, sure. Um, so let's say um, if I have CH3 plus C2H4, so methyl radical plus acetylene, no, plus ethylene, I'll make propyl radical. And uh, if, the if the temperature is low enough and the pressure is high enough, I'll just make almost 100% propyl radical. And as I increase the temperature and lower the pressure, there's a probability that a little bit of this stuff will go on to make H plus propylene. Is that right? I could run it in reverse, which is the, this one here. That would be when I take propene and H atoms. If I add, if the H atom adds to the middle carbon, I'll make this radical, and then this would preferentially fall apart to methyl plus C2H4 at low pressure. But at high pressure, I can trap the purple radical. All right, this is actually a really important reaction. So this is a way that um, how you can make methyl radicals accumulate pretty high concentrations. And this is a way that they can kind of make H atoms, which kind of carry on the chemistry more. All right, and both of these reactions have barriers. You could also have the same case um, with no barriers. And we did, we did this one already, right? This is uh, H plus O2. Yeah, yeah, these are well skipping. So the A plus B going to C plus D is well skipping because you've skipped over this well, and vice versa. Um, and then if you have a high enough pressure, you trap it so that you don't skip the well. Yeah. Um, OK. Yeah, so you really, if you're high enough pressure, you go into the well. If you're high enough pressure and a high enough temperature, you, then you come back out of the well. Yeah, that's right. And you have a low pressure, you get into the well, but you just sail right through it because you don't have, you can never get trapped in the well, you just fly through. Or else bounce right back to where you came. All right, 
So this one's super important one. This is the combustion reaction H plus O2. And this is the same. So at low temperatures, high pressures, it just goes like this. At high enough temperatures, some of it leaks across. This one, uh, the, the molecule is so small that the density of states rho is very small. That means KD of E is, and the well is pretty shallow too. So KD of E is very high, it's particularly to go this way. So it's hard to get high enough pressure to really saturate it and make it really in the high pressure limit. So this will always be in fall off um, this way. And then. Uh, I don't think there's a setup point. I think it's just, just, I'm not sure actually. Maybe there's a tiny little setup point. Probably depends on what quantum method you use about whether you see a setup point or not. All right. Um, all right, now let's try two wells. So we suppose you have just uh, isomers. So uh, case I was, I'm pretty familiar with this. C2H3OH, final alcohol, or ethenol, and it's in equilibrium with acetaldehyde, CH3CHO. And if you do chemistry of alcohols, um, it's easy to make these things. This is like a C double bonds OH. It's, this is one of the products you can make. By you have a, you start it with an alcohol. Like, for example, uh, suppose you started with uh, propanol. You can pull off an H here to make this radical, and then this, and that's the weakest bond because this radical stabilized because it's next to the O atom. And then this thing can beta scission, where you break this bond and make the alcohol, the enol, and you make the methyl radical. So that's, a, that's very common for alcohols to break this way. So you make this, this C double bond OH thing, but that's not stable. It never observed in, in, in uh, room temperature normal experiments. And so it likes to instead go to acetaldehyde, which is this. OK, so one of the H's hops over. So this one is H. And this one is. So this H that was here hopped across under the carbon. But there's a pretty high barrier for that because it's a four-membered ring transition state. So it's very strained. So there's a pretty high barrier in between them. So you can form this. And it's even at 1,000 Kelvin, it's stable. You see it in the flame. Um, but it's always, it's always reacting away. And um, so if I make this, um, I always have it reacting across to form this. Now, if I wait for a long time at 1,000 Kelvin, what will happen? I should have. Well, other things will happen too, yes, sir. <laughs> but just this is one molecule by itself sitting there. Um, it'll, it'll, uh, it, these two will collaborate. So this will, this will react until you form most of it's over here. You have a lot of population over here and less over here. And so mostly it'd be this way. And so you see that in the flame, in the, if you have an alcohol flame that's rich, you'll make some of this. If you look farther up and up and up, you see more and more of the aldehyde. And less, like the ratio of these two guys, you can measure the ratio of these two peaks. And gradually it's going here. And part of that's from this unimolecular reaction, and part of it's from some other reactions. Do you always assume a bulk time distribution of the population within the energy block? Um, when you first form them, sometimes you're not Boltzmann. Uh, if you wait long enough, they live long enough, then usually they get to be Boltzmann. And usually, species, Boltzmann? even radicals too. So, if you, if they live more than maybe ten collisions with nitrogen, usually they'll match the the temperature of the nitrogen. Um, but some of them don't live that long. <laughs> some of them are gone like that. Yeah. So, um, so this is a a case I'm interested in another rate coefficient. So I want to know. If I do the logarithm, log of k versus 1 over t, for the enol going to the aldehyde, what do I expect? Should be straight line. Should be regular Arrhenius, right? 
more or less, like that. How about if I lower the pressure? What will happen? Flatten at the end, same thing, right? So it should be like that, right? The lower pressure, OK? Um, and so it's just regular fall off. And then if I run long enough, I should get equilibrate. If I do the reverse reaction, it's all the same. Just the, the barrier is higher in reverse, because or the equilibrium constant favors the, the one side over the other. So the reverse, the reverse reaction will be slower and steeper, like that. So this is enol to the keto form. And this is keto to the enol form. And the fall off will be similar right, at the lower pressure compared to the high pressure limit. Is that OK? All right. So now let's do a, a trickier one. Um, so suppose I have um, something can I summarize easily? Oh, that's a good idea. So suppose I make the enol by adding OH to C2H4. So is this going to work? Yeah. All right. So I have OH plus C2H4. This has a small barrier. It makes HOCH2CH2 um, radical. And then this has some barrier to do the four member rate transfer. This is from a radical, so the barrier is a little bit lower than before. And it can make O dot CH2CH3. Um, and this one can be a decision to formaldehyde plus CH3. OK? So this is a, if you have an ethylene flame, you'll have this happening all the time. You make this radical. Um, this radical can do a couple things, actually. But one of the things it can do is do the uh, H transfer through a four-membered ring to make this. And then this can be a decision to make formaldehyde plus this. So because this barrier, initial barrier is low, if I make the Arrhenius plot for OH to products, then I expect to see something with a kind of a low barrier like that, right? Because uh, it has a low barrier, so the EA should be small, so the T dependence should be small. And, and OH is pretty reactive, so it's still pretty fast reaction there. Okay? And so now the question is really, what products do I make? So in the high pressure limit, what do I make? Right, so in the high pressure limit, um, this is all OH uh, plus C2H4 to the first adduct, HO, CH2, CH2. So this is, this is P equals infinity. Let me lower this down. OK, so now I lower the pressure a tiny bit. What happens next? So there's a slightly lower pressure. Yeah, so I have a lot of, I have this guy coming in. Um, at high pressure, most of it's getting trapped. Tiny, tiny bits getting back. Most of it, a significant amount of it's going this way to go across to make the, this guy. Yeah. So, uh, so at low pressures, and it's, this is more important at the higher temperatures. So here I'll see that this yield of the, this channel will go down a little bit. And what I'll see is a new channel coming in. And this is the um, OCH2CH2. Actually, I just need to go higher temperatures here to see it more. All right. And then if I uh, lower the pressure a little bit more, or raise the temperature, say I raise the temperature, 
what's going to happen is that this is not going to stay. So if the temperature is higher, I come in higher here, because these are hotter. So then less of them gets trapped, more of them come across. But these guys are so high above this barrier that they just keep going. So the highest temperatures I'm going to see, these are the products. So this is no longer going to be the product. So this is going to go up and go back down. And there's going to be another channel coming in. And I'll get rid of this now. So this is now the product CH2O plus CH3. This is the O dot form, the O, C, 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 H3. And this one here is the initial adduct, H, O, C, H2, C, H2. All right? And so you get these really wild things, this very non-monotonic Arrhenius plot for this reaction of OH plus CH2, O4 to this product. Whereas the total rate is actually very sensible. So the total rate is always the same the amount that comes in, it's a regular Arrhenius behavior because it's just coming over a barrier just like normal. It's just what happens after it gets across the barrier depends wildly on the temperature and the pressure. And as you change the pressure, the position, the temperature where this thing hits its maximum will switch around depending on the pressure. So it'll be still qualitatively the same shape, but move around. And it's like the one's going away, the other one's coming in, the other one's like that. All right, so anyway, this is what the, this is where you want to have a program that does a multi-well calculation for you. Because <laughs> uh, trying to, you know, you can have the idea of what happens in your head, but trying to do this numerically and figure out what it really is is a project. So, but fortunately, there's programs you can get. Second law is enforced through the master equation? Yeah, so the master equation, if you, if you write it reversibly, yeah, everything's fine. It's all second law, everything's fine. You have to, the matrix elements, um, they have, should be rho, rho of E, K of E is equal to, so the other rho of E, K prime, K reverse of E. This has to be satisfied at each element. But if, they, if the person fills in the matrix, master equation correctly, it'll be true. And the same, there's a one for the collisional energy transfer to make sure it gets Boltzmann. It has to be also satisfied. But again, if they use a program, somebody did it correctly without making a mistake. It'll all be correct. Yeah. All right. Okay, I think you guys are now experts in multi-well uh, uh, temperature and pressure dependence. So now you won't be surprised when you see these plots. Oh, actually, one thing to warn you about. This thing with this non-monotonic form, in the older versions of Chemkin, there's no way to represent it. So you'll see in kinetic models that people will report uh, these Arrhenius forms where they have gigantic A factors, like 10 to the 150th power. And then they'll have T to the negative 470th power, or something like that. And that's trying to get the curvature to represent uh, things like this, where it's like wildly vertical, you know, and then all of a sudden it's more normal. So to make that curved, you can actually get that with a t to the n type thing if you use crazy val powers of n and, and wild values of a. So you'll see some mechanisms that have those things. If you ever see a crazy value of a and a crazy value of n together, almost always it's the result of a pressure-dependent calculation or a pressure-dependent reaction like this. Um, but this one where it goes up and down, there is no way to represent that in the old versions of Chemkin. So any reaction like this is just not represented, or it's crazy, whatever they have, because there's just no way to represent it, because their form is only monotonic, the form that they allow for K of T. It doesn't allow for non-monotonic K of T. So, um, but there's a new version, Chemkin Pro, and it has uh, uh, called a Chebyshev representation. It's a different representation that allows you to do non-monotonic forms. Um, but this is a problem, because I think a lot of you might be using old versions of Chemkin inside your CFD solvers. I don't know if any of you do this. Or in your engines codes. And they won't let you use the correct form of the KFTP. And also, a lot of mechanisms in the literature will say on them, this is for pressure equals 10 bar. Or this is pressure equals 1 bar. And they'll have different uh, A's and N's 
to try to get how the curvature is different because the, the position of this of this knee is different at different pressures you know, in the temperature space. So they'll have the person who made the model will explicitly say this model is only good at whatever pressure they said. Now, of course, you'll want to use it at some different pressure. And you can go ahead and do it, but then you know, the guy who made the model, he knows it's not right there. That's why he wouldn't, he wouldn't have said it's only used at this pressure. So um, again, if you can get the, value, the more modern codes that have more flexible representations of K of TP, they'll allow you to represent it correctly, and you'll at least get it. Um, but there's, a, there's an issue there that the forms that are allowed for the kinetics codes are kind of restrictive, and sometimes they don't really wrap, match the real shapes of the KFTPs. And so even though we know what they are, it's hard to get them into the kinetic models because the, the forms of, the, of how you're allowed to write them in the models is, not, is too restrictive. All right. Uh, that's all I have to say. You guys have questions? No? OK. Thank you very much for your attention.